As any good time management lecture, we are on the Babbage time, 10 minutes late. <laughs> Many of you sitting here right now, listening to me talking, are thinking either one of two things. Either you'll become bored during my speech, in which case time will drag by, or you'll like what I'm saying, in which case time will probably pass by very quickly. But it is the same 45 minutes, where that's the goal. Today I'm going to talk to you about that, about time, value of time, what time means to us, and especially in today's session, how it applies in Torah thought, what does Torah think of it, and then the second stage, how to manage time, how to deal with time, time to time time. You're going to hear that word a lot. Now there's a, they say a story. There was this Jew that was waiting by the train station. And in the distance he sees that there's another Jew who's waiting for the same train. So he approaches him and he asks him, excuse me, can you please tell me the time? The other Jew ignores him completely, as if he doesn't exist. He tries a second time, maybe he didn't hear him properly. He says, excuse me, can I please have the time? Do you have the time? Again, he completely ignores him. He tries a third time. Excuse me, I'm asking you for the time. Do you have the time? Again, no response. He nudges him a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time. Until the point where this, the other Jew standing there turns to him and says, Okay, one second, you listen to me. You listen to me right now. If I were to respond to you, and tell you what time it is. The chances are that you might decide that this was a nice opening for a discussion and you're going to continue discussing with me and having a conversation. That being said, the chances are that once the train arrives, you are probably going to ascend onto the same car that I am going on to and you're probably going to be sitting next to me and to, conti to continue the conversation. That being said, the chances are, then, that my Jewish guilt will set in, and I will decide, how can I let this uh, opportunity pass by without inviting you for a Shabbat dinner? So the chances are, I'm probably going to invite you to my house. And the chances are, that once I invite you to my house for a Shabbat dinner, you are probably going to come. Now I have a daughter, says this Jew. She's a very nice girl. You look like a very nice boy. The chances are that you'll meet each other and you'll take a liking for each other. And the chances are that after you meet each other and like each other, you are probably going to get engaged. Now let me ask you, says the other Jew. Do I really want a son-in-law who cannot afford a watch? <laughs> so today I want to talk about time. You see, there are, the research shows that there are two types of time. They like to make two distinctions. There is clock time, 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes to an hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and so on and so forth. And so forth. There's clock time, and clock time never changes. But then there's the other side, real time, clock time versus real time. <clears throat> and so by clock time, never changes. The session starts at 9.45 today. It's going to continue on till possibly 10.30. Then you'll go on to the next class, and then the next class, and the day's going to go by, and time is not going to go slower. But then you have the real time. Real time can either go quickly or slowly. And so I want to discuss that. Where does time really go? 
Seemingly, we are living in an era where time should be able to be managed properly. You see, let's look at 30 years ago, or even 25 years ago. You know what, even less. When I grew up, it was still that way. I still remember this a little bit. Before the, <clears throat> the internet became a common ground for every household, and before emails and WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram and all, all the social network, in order to communicate with somebody, the slow way, which was the way that we communicated over the last couple hundred years with mail, you sent an envelope. The more quick way is a fax. You'll be sending a fax to somebody. And that was pretty quick. You write your letter, you put it into the fax machine, and it goes through instantly. The other person received it. However, even that still took some time. You had to be in your office or in your house. The other person receiving it had, had to be in his office or in his house to receive that fax. And so it still took a bit of time. And in general, with all technology and, the, and new inventions that have occurred over the last 20 years and how things have sprung, things have just gotten more quicker and quicker. And the communication wise and getting jobs done became instantaneous. Now it's no longer, I will wait three days for a response by mail. Now it's not even, I will wait till the afternoon until the fax comes through. Now, if I do not receive an email response in the next 15 minutes, I'm already going to get agitated and I'm going to be sending a WhatsApp saying, did you receive my email? Not fast for sure. Calling you, just sending a WhatsApp. <laughs> so, seemingly, with the amount of speed that we get things done, you might think that we have a lot of time now on our hands. Yet at the same time, we feel that we, don't, we still don't have any time. Our Friday afternoons during the summertime is, very, is much longer than the Friday afternoons during the wintertime. And yet, we're not sitting on the couch for three hours. It's all relative. So how exactly do we manage this time? And why is it that people still don't have time, despite the fact that things can get done much quicker? May I suggest, a big part of it is due to a reduction in productivity. That we get so caught on with the social network and things that are happening socially, that we, that we have a lot more distractions than before to distract us from what we really need to get done. And there's an astounding number of a poll that was done in, in the United States over the last uh, two years. And it was a study, <clears throat> and they studied, and they, and they tried to understand and calculate collectively how many hours are wasted in the world collectively every single day on a social network. Let me put the number onto the screen. 12 billion, 207 million, 423 thousand, 487 hours collectively every single day in the world are wasted on the social network. Talk about the game things done. An astounding number. So now I want to discuss with you about what's a Torah thought on time. First of all, I want to discuss with you about the value of time, how Torah views the value of time. And then to discuss with you what's a Torah thought on managing time and in doing so, I want to also compare that a little bit with um, studies, the general studies in the world about uh, managing time. So the value of time. Time is very important in the time. In fact, the very first mitzvah given to the Jewish people when they first came out of Mitzrayim, or before they even left Mitzrayim, was about time. Let's look at this puzzle. It says, Hachaydesh hazeh lachem reish kadashim, rishayn bulachem chachayashon. The mitzvah, 
that Hashem has commanded us, that this month shall be lachem, to you. It should be yours. And you should appoint this month, the month of Nisan, those referring to, as the head of all months of the year. So let's emphasize that word lachem, the third word. Achash Hazed, this month, is teaching us about sanctifying the month and instructing the month. But let's look at that word, lachem, to you. You are in control of time. You are in control of instituting the months. Beforehand, you were subjugated to time, says, says Hashem. You were not owners of your own time, you were slaves. Time had control over you. Now, the mitzvah has been given over to you. Time has been given over to you for you to use it to the, most, to the utmost. And to quote the Svarna on the screen, that it is yours. From here and onwards, the months are now yours. And in the dots in between, it was explaining how beforehand you were Meshuvah, before that you were subjugated to time, but now you are in control of time. Why? Because now, with your renewed power of free choice, the task and challenge and mitzvah has been given over to you. So the Torah definitely has what to say about us managing time. Time is of utmost importance. And we must use it to, the, to our very best. <clears throat> so we have proper time, value of time. And it's not just the first bit of the Torah. In fact, we see throughout the love that time is very, very important. Basic, classic examples that we experience all the time. We have Shabbos. Right? Shabbos came in 8-28. This past Friday. There's 18 minutes from that point on to Shkiyam. And it's precise. You know, there's, there's a woman called Sarah Esther Crisp. She's a, she's a woman speaker and you can find a lot of lectures on Chabad.org. She describes in an article. Describes how um, she's a Baal's children. She was not thrown her entire life. And her first opportunity to get a flavor of Yiddishkeit was when she went to Yerushalayim on a trip. And she was invited to a certain house on Friday afternoon. She was invited for Shabbat dinner. And they called it for 6 30. They said, be, be there no later than 6 30. And she was thinking to herself, it's just a dinner. It's not like the train is leaving. It's not like I'm catching a flight or a train or whatever it is. So 6.30, I'll be there 6.30. If I come 6.35, it's not a big deal. So she comes around 6.35, 6.40. She comes about five minutes late. And she sees that there are candles lit on the table. And she realizes that everyone uh, lit candles. All the women lit candles before seeing them. She said, perfect. Let me just go light a candle. But then the Balabasta turned to and said, no, no, you're too late. It is the first time that she, that she found out about this concept, that Judaism has something about time. And the fact that she came 6.35, 6.31, she missed the time to light Shabbos candles. So time definitely has an importance. Then you have something, then you have 18 minutes of Pesach. You know, baking matzah. You have 18 minutes before the dough rises. How about six hours from eating meat to eating milk? Or one hour from milk to meat? Depends on different opinions. But we see that time definitely has a lot of value. You know, it's interesting. If we take through the entire dialogue, we see that there's a very commonly used word. And particularly in the Shema. And that word is Hayom, today. Yeah. This is, and this is the command which I'm commanding to you today. 
place in your heart. What is this today? Is this today referring to the first, the, the first day of creation? Is it talking about maybe the first day that Adam was created? Or maybe is it talking about the day that the Jewish people became a nation? Or maybe today it was talking about Har Sinai when the Torah was actually given. What is this today? Is it Rosh Hashanah? We know that another word Hayyam is used, Atam Nitzav Nitzav and Hayyam. You are standing today, and Chazal tells us that today in Nitzav he was talking about the day of Rosh Hashanah. Perhaps we're talking about Rosh Hashanah. The answer is Hayyam today means literally today. <clears throat> Every single day to use the Yavadosh. And today is the day to do it. Today, right now, this instant is the opportunity to do so. There's a story in the 16th century, in the 16th century, of, unfortunately, this is a very classic story and very, very common, and we hear this story all the time, about a Moshka, or Moshe, who had an inn, and the counts, the baron, the parks of the, of the town, he, the same people felt behind his rent, he wasn't able to pay up, and the parks decided to throw him into the dungeon. But this part decided on himself, he said, he decided on himself he has so-called mercy, so-called kindness. And so he went over, and so he visited this Jew who's sitting in the, in the dungeon, and he said, you know, I'm a merciful fellow. And so therefore, I will do you a little bit of kindness. I'm not going to take you out of the dungeon very quickly. And I know that you'll be here for a very, very long time. But you know what? I'm a kind person, so I'll do you a favor. I'll give you one day a year. <clears throat> that one day you are allowed to go out. That day you are free. You can visit your family. You can learn. You can pray. You can do whatever you want. You are completely free man for that one day. And when that day is over, you have to return back to the dungeon. So now this Jew is... Baffled. He doesn't know what to do. What day should he choose? What day would you choose? Would you choose Rosh Hashanah? Maybe Yom Kippur? How about more personally? How about anniversary? Or your birthday? Or Hanukkah? How about Pesach? It's a family time. Family time to spend time with the same, by the same with your family. So he turned to the rabbi at the time, who was the Red Vaz? And he posted him this question. And what do you think the Red Vaz answered? He told him the day that you should choose is today. If you have an opportunity to free yourself, if you have an opportunity to leave the dungeon, take it. Do not wait for three months from now, six months from now. The day that you should choose, if you have an opportunity to become free, take it. Today. Such is the value of time. <clears throat> okay, so, let me give you some examples on the value of time from the Mishnah, from Perkyavos. Now, unfortunately, I cannot bring it on the screen now, but I'll say it outside. We have the mission in Prikiyavis. Known to many of you. The Imloyashad Imatzah. Not now, when. And it's a Pharisee stroll. Some of you may know the large Mishnahites will know on the bottom where it has two pillows, Yachin and Bayaz. And in the commentary, this is the Pharisee stroll. And he explains that what does it mean, Imloyashad Imatzah? If I do not value and use my opportunity now, and if I decide I'm going to wait until I figure out meaning of life before I decide to manage my time properly, perhaps will come a time I'll become too old or that time will never show up for me to properly use my time wisely. There's another mission in the next, that was the first part, first chapter of Ethics. And the second chapter it says, Hayyun Kotzer, Rabbi Tarkin says, Hayyun Kotzer, where the day is short and the work is very long. And the Bartonura explains, Hayyun Kotzer, I have the day that I have to utilize my time. And take note, he says, I even cut to the day is short. So what, what are we talking about here? Clock time or real time? 
real time. The day is short. The day is short for me to use to my utmost potential. And the work is great. And I should not push it off till I become older. Similarly, another Mishnah in Priyabas. One should not say, when I have the time, when I have the time, I'll come to learn. I'll sit down to learn. Perhaps that time will never come. And the commentaries explain that this is not necessarily talking about the time that you have now when you are busy. This is the time talking about your break time. Those few minutes that you have a break. Those times. One should not think, now it's just 10 minutes. I don't have a half an hour to learn. I only have 10 minutes, so maybe I should just push it off until I have a half an hour to sit down and learn. The commentaries explain that these 10 minutes are valuable, and one should not push things up. Just to throw one more, the Hayyoyim of Pizayin Tashim, where the Rebbe quotes, he says, that one must be very vigilant in time. One must use the time to his utmost and understand that time is of essence and every moment counts. A summer day and a winter night is a year. Which the basic explanation of that is how every minute of the day counts and every minute of the day is important. And we should treat each day like it's a summer day and each night like it's a winter night. So how do we manage time? So how do we manage time? Well, there are two things that we can do. There's planning. And then there's control. Plan time. And then control time. Planning time. You see that in the term as well. It's a Gemara and Shabbos. Rav Hanun Nesavar Zman Tfila Luchud Zman Taira Luchud The discussion in the Gemara is that there was a discussion of what um, Rava Rava came over to Rav Hanun in the Gemara and he asked him how can someone spend so much time learning the, the Dabni he is taking away from something which is eternal, which is terror, terror is eternal. He's taking away from something he can be involved with, this, which is eternal, and he's dealing with something which is only for that time period. It's a dominant. Rabbi Muna, he answered him and responded that the Abni has its time and learning has its time. And we should not mix up one from the other. So there's schedule. Time to Schedule. So how do we manage that? And the answer is, my dear fellows, managing time is all about taking what you have now and focusing on it entirely as if everything else does not exist. You know, there are explained in the Sitha in Chaf Shvat, in Tav Shavu, on the 20th of Shvat, in 1970. And he brought a story that he himself was part of that story he witnessed of his father-in-law, the previous father. The previous Rebbe at that time in the 1920s was very, very dangerous to spread Judaism and the, and the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, was at the forefront. He was at the head of spreading Judaism in the, in the, in the former Soviet Union. And during that time he was already under constant watch from the KGB and they were after him. And they were watching his every move. And however dangerous it was for him to do activities in his own house, it was even more dangerous for him to do activities outside of his house. And now the previous Rebbe was traveling from Leningrad, or today St. Petersburg, he was traveling to Moscow, which was the capital of the Soviet Union. And he was going there by train. And so if you imagine the severity, the intenseness of the situation, he's about to go on the train, which means he'll be in the public eye, and the KGB for sure will be following him the entire way. He's going to Moscow, the capital of the Soviet Union, and he's going right into the lion's den. And you're going to be involved with something in relation to spreading the Yiddish name. And so there was a train he was, that he had to catch. And the Rebbe observed, the current Rebbe, that he observed that his father-in-law, a few crucial minutes before the train was to depart, he was noticing that his father-in-law was involved with something else entirely. He was writing letters to different Rabbanim about certain things. And the Rebbe was astounded. 
The Rebbe was astounded. And let's make no mistake, the Rebbe himself was a master of time. We know throughout the 44 years of that, that the Rebbe was sitting in 770 and managing and, and being Rebbe. Thousands upon thousands of letters he was sending out and responding to people. He had lengthy fabrings which were lasting hours upon hours long. He was meeting with ladies. He was in charge of records leading on and running all the activities and, and outreach. And he was in contact with many shulchan around the world. And despite that, when someone was, once asked the Rebbe, how does he manage time and what does he use with his time, the Rebbe responded to him, 70% of my day is learning time. Now think about that. Remember, 70% of his day learning terms by all the, the amount that he does this in, day, in one single day, he was spending that much learning time. So the Rebbe definitely was a master over time. And the Rebbe himself was astounded. He turns to his father who was sitting there writing letters right before he was about to embark, embark on the train, and he asked the Rebbe, he asked his father in law, Adkidekha? That much? Really? To that, to, that, to that extent? And the previous Rebbe answered him, We know that the Rashba, the big sage, sage in Hanel, and had responses, we know that he, he gave a shiur, he gave a lecture to the yeshiva three times a day. He had thousands and thousands of responses to other rabbis, and it's printed, Shalas Machilva Sirashba, volume upon volume. He was a doctor. So literally he was healing people, visiting sick and healing people. And he had a tremendously busy schedule. And despite all that, he found time every single day to go for a walk. And so the Rashba was a master of how to use time wisely. And the previous Rebbe said, the idea of the and taught the Rebbe, gave over the message to the Rebbe in the 1920s, that the power of managing time is to be a Tummim. What is a Tummim? Tummim is someone who whatever he's involved with, he's involved with all the way. Nothing else exists besides a task that he has to do right at that moment. And that's the power of managing time. That is how the previous Rebbe was able to send letters and write letters to other people when he had a train to catch in a few short minutes. Because during the time they had, while waiting for the train, he was involved with something else, and the train did not exist for those few minutes. And it's not just a Torah thought. University of Delaware in the 1980s made, a, made a, um, a survey, and they took approximately 3,000 businessmen together over, over the United States. And what they found was that those who multitasked had a 40% reduction of productivity over those who worked one thing at a time. We took each task and worked on it. And once they finish that, they move to the next task. And when they do that, they move to the next task. Those people who deal with one task at a time, 40% productivity more than those who multitask, who try to deal with two, three things at once. Another point that we tend to lose is that when we deal with time and we try to multitask, sometimes we do not appreciate as much the task that we're involved with or be most attentive to the task that we are involved with because we may be thinking about something else. Let's take an example here in Victoria. We have a beautiful scenic road and I know that there are some guests here from Sydney and if you've been to this place, that's great. And if not, I encourage you to visit. The Great Ocean Road. A beautiful scenic memorial road. And you know, we know you can go to the beginning of the Great Ocean Road let us say that you, you are been planning to drive through the entire road, and let us say that about halfway in, about two hours in, you're going to go inland and you're going to go on the all the way to treetop walk. Some of you may know. And so imagine this. You have a schedule, you're going to go to the, uh, to the treetop walk, and you have a, you're planning it for 3 o'clock. It's 1 o'clock right now, you know it takes two hours to get to the treetop walk, you're going to take the route going through the Great Ocean Road, and at 3 o'clock you're going to make it to the treetop walk. 
So imagine there's this person. He has a, he's driving a minivan. A van. He is he, ha, he has his entire family in the back, and he's trying to make things run on time. And he's going along the road, and he's driving along the Grailsham Road. And the only thing that's going through his head now is it's now 1:15. An hour and 45 minutes left until we make it to Tree Hill. Okay, it's 1:30. It's 1:45. It's 2 o'clock. Let me look at my GPS. Let me see if I'm running late or are we going to be on time. And the entire time, during the entire two hours, all the way to the treetop walk, he's constantly thinking about the time that he has left and where he is holding on the road. Now, while he is driving towards that treetop walk, he's passing through one of the most beautiful scenic drives in Australia, a memorial road of that. And the most beautiful scenery, driving along the beach with the mountains and passing through towns, Lorne and Anglesey, what have you. And it's a beautiful drive. A beautiful drive. And yet his mind is not there. His mind is at his destination. His mind is what he's going to do next. His mind is not where he is now. And you can imagine the loss that he has personally. His family looked out the window and they enjoyed the beautiful scenery, but he was not there at all. And so we can see sometimes that we can be involved in something what we're going to do next, and we're trying to multitask, to drive down that road while at the same time thinking about where we're going to be next, we lose the moment. And so, single tasking, in the way of a tunnel, all the way, as if nothing else exists, we truly appreciate life. So there are some tips I'm under, I am unable to bring on the screen. Well, let me share with you at the top of my head what, um, what I wrote down. Here are some tips. Research shows that those who sit down at the beginning of a business day and spend 30 minutes planning out their day have, have an 80% um, improvement in, in work productivity. So all it takes is just some time in the beginning of the day to plan out your day, schedule. In addition to that, there are other tips that during the course of the day, after you finish one task, take 30 seconds or a minute to think about the next task that you're planning to do and what you want to attain. That's another tip. There's a tip which is very applicable to today's time. See how long you can last without any notifications from Facebook, WhatsApp, or Instagram, or any other social network. See if you, see if you can shut yourself up. There's a research that shows that it takes just 20% of our thoughts during the day to produce 80% of our achievements. 20% of thinking results in 80% of productivity. And so therefore, when we want to plan our day, and, we, and many of us, myself included, very much so, suffer from uh, letting our minds wander and not being involved in, in work or what we have to do when we might start wondering. Let us plan and set goals to, to manage that at least 50%. And it's okay to do this because like I said before, 20% of our thoughts produce 80% of results. So you can plan 50% of your time you're going to be used, utilizing it. And start off with that, at least 50%. And then, as you master 50%, you can go further, more, and more, and more. And one more tip I just want to leave with is, sometimes work can be very intense, you need to do what you need to do. Try going off the grid. Try to see if you can lock yourself in a room, or if you're in an office, to, put, to try putting on a do not disturb sign outside the door. And see if you're able to lock everything out, close everything out, and be able to manage your time wisely. There was a disclaimer that I wanted to uh, say at the beginning of the lecture, and that was that for those who know me, my family, my family and friends, and close friends who know me, I am not the master of time. I don't claim to be the master of time. I don't, I don't claim to be what they call a yet, someone who is precise to the second. That's precisely why I'm very interested and passionate about this subject. So when I say we, and when I say myself included, I really mean so. And let us. Uh, let us do this together. Okay, so it's 
sounds all nice and good. Terry teaches us the value of time and how to manage time. Terry teaches us about the value of every single moment that we need to use to our potential and teaches us how to use every single moment to its utmost. Are we done? Is there anything left? What do you think? Is there something missing here? I find something missing. Give me a break! You just told me that Tara has value, and that time has value, and every single moment of the day is precious. I can't work all day. I'm not a workaholic. I need a break. Sometimes, just give me a break, a few minutes to relax. Don't be so uptight and so intense on me. Give me a few minutes. But raise your hands. How many of you think that God, ideally, prefers us not to have a break at all and wants us to use our time entirely? Praise the hands. Thank goodness. Only a few of you. Raise your hands. How many of you ever do think that God truly wants us to have a break sometimes? All right. The answer is yes, but depends. You know, yesterday, yesterday, Rabbi Shishel was giving a talk. Clark was giving a talk about uh, about does God have empathy? And he was explaining, uh, during his talk, he was explaining that the most typical response he had from a rabbi when you're asking him a shalom, a halakha, when you're asking him something to trade for a kosher, or what have you, the response usually is, depends. There's no definitive answer. You have such a straightforward terror, straightforward halakha, that everything is so clear cut, isn't it? Depends. Yes, but depends. What do I mean by that? I mean that, yes, God wants us to have a vacation, provided that we're using the right way. You know, thank goodness we are in Australia right now, that we define our summertime properly. What I mean by that is that there's a difference in terminology between vacation and holidays. And the Rebbe speaks about this uh, concept. You see, vacation, when we talk about vacancy, where in everyday life do you see that word a lot? I would say it's a toilet. Vacant. This is vacant. What does it mean vacant? Vacant. Void. Completely empty. Nothing inside it. But the Reverend remarks a holiday. What is holiday? Just without the spelling, what does the word sound like? It sounds like it's meant with two words. Holy day. They're taking the day, commemorating it, and making it holy. And so the Reverend remarks, the difference between the vacation and the holiday is that vacation, you, it's full of emptiness. We just waste our time. We just sit around and watch the wall. Or perhaps something better. Holiday is that we take a day, we make a whole, and we use that time, our recharging time, and when we use it in a, in a proper way, it gives us full freedom to recharge so that we'll be ready to return to work. And that's precisely what we are doing here today, right now. By you coming here today, this morning, and listening to my level about time management. That you are making today your summer holiday. By enjoying a nice, easy lecture about time management and how to use time management, now you have recharged your batteries and you're ready to return to work because you have had a productive break. And so that's the rule that we learn about holiday, and that is the importance of holiday. It's very interesting that the term puts relaxation and terror together. The way terror study and relaxation together. We know by the Miracle. We know Jewish history when the, the Jewish people came out of Egypt and they received the Torah and they were about, one year later, they were about to go into Eretz Yisrael. And that would have been it. They have gone to Eretz Yisrael, all would have been good. Before they went in, the Jewish people decided that they want to send in spies. Spies to seek out the land and to come back and give a report. And the spies, we know, they came and they looked and they came back and said the land is not good. The Rebbe gives a deeper meaning of this whole entire story. 
that the Moroccan and the spies were, felt that they were on a higher level. And they felt that they were, the entire time that they were in the desert, they were silver spoon fed. They had the clouds protecting them from the weather. The clothes were constantly washed for them. They had everything they needed to eat. They lacked nothing. And what they were able to do was learn Torah all day. And what they were worried about was that when they come to Israel, they're going to have to work the land. They're going to have to work. They didn't want to work. They all preferred to learn Torah all day. What happened afterwards happened afterwards. However, there was a mitzvah that Hashem gave us that that mitzvah is kind of a response to the Miraglum's complaint that they wanted to spend time learning Torah. Hashem says, yes, go into Israel. You need to work. You need to work every single day, and that's what I want. And that's my purpose of the world, that you go into the world and you work. You sow the land, you plant, you work the fields. However, says Hashem, I will give you a break. I'll give you the seventh year, Shemitah, which is our year now. Tosh 9 and 8, 5, 7, 7, 5 is the year of Shemitah. I'll give you Shemitah. The time of Shemitah, you are not allowed to work in the field. What are you supposed to do? Hashem says, I'll give you a year's break to do what? To learn Torah. That's a break. In fact, it's a mitzvah to have a break. And yet that break is learning Torah. And so it's quite interesting. The Torah puts relaxation and learning Torah together. And it all goes hand in hand. When we take our vacation time, vacation time and we redefine it, like I said, thank God we're in Australia. Australia is called a holiday. When we are utilizing it as a holiday and we're making the holy, then we truly recharge the batteries. It's evident from myself in the there are days uh, during the vacation where I'll be sitting down and doing absolutely nothing and looking at the wall. I'm looking forward to going back to work. I'm looking forward to, you know, like the cuddle is going to give us a, a two-week holiday, a summer holiday right now. I, I know for myself, if I decide to do nothing for two, three days, after two, three days, I'm going to be extremely bored. I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go back. Two weeks cannot come, cannot finish soon enough. However, if you use it as a holiday, and we're utilizing our time like we are all here doing today. We're doing all here today. Coming to, our, to, to a lecture in Yachi Kala and enjoying our summer break by doing something productive and listening to a Torah talk. That's how we truly recharge our batteries and enjoy our break time. And to just finish up, comparing our times of Mashiach, in the second last halacha that the Ramam gives us, now recently we just made a scene of the Ramam, we just finished the Ramam. So in the second last halacha, Hilchus Malachim, Perak Yud Beis, Halacha Yud Dawa, I believe. It's not on the screen. It's a, it's a famous one. Loi Nisabu Afacham Evan Nevi'im Yimaisa Mashiach. The wise people on the Nevi'im, they do not desire for Mashiach to come unless, on a certain condition. What did they want in, in Mashiach's coming? That they should be familiar, they should be free. Have free time in what? Sages wanted free time so that they can learn Torah and attain wisdom through it. That was their definition of free time. And so I hope that all of you sitting here today had come with a new understanding of time, appreciation of time, to know how time is of value, and time has been giving, given to us as a gift, and has been given to us as a mitzvah, to utilize it to our utmost in the way of a tongue, to the fullest extent, and we can all pat ourselves on the back now that we utilize our time today as a holiday to use it to the utmost, and may it come speedily, on May. That, that the Mashiach is going to come and we'll have all the free time to be studying Torah properly and we're not going to be bored by that as Rabbi Yossi Rabbi will explain on Friday about the Mashiach's coming how every day of learning is going to be such a revelation that we're going to be going, that everything is going to be seen it's not going to be virtual but everything will be in our own eyes we'll be able to utilize our time fully and learn Torah and mitzvahs and may Mashiach come immediately now Thank you very much.